Today we're going to be talking about DICOMs. This is the currency of medical imaging. This is how we actually transfer the information using DICOM images. What do you think, Rad Nation? Do you think the DICOM standard was defined before or after I was born? Stay tuned to the end to see if DICOM or Brian is older. Before DICOM, in the 70s and the early 80s, most of the imaging was still done with film, but in the case that you were doing digital imaging for CT, for instance, which was digital the whole time it was a modality, there was actually a problem in that if vendor A had a CT scanner, vendor B had a CT scanner, they could make them have different formats for the actual way that you were storing the file. So vendor A's system might not play nice with the other vendors. So vendor A's images could go to the packs on vendor A and vendor B's images could go to the packs on vendor B. But if you have a different packs vendor that doesn't have a scanner, there's not necessarily going to be good agreement and a good handshake to actually have a way to send the images from the scanner over to the packs. So the digital imaging and communication and medicine group met, the seas parted, and everything was clear. After DICOM is defined, now we can have multiple types of scanners across multiple different types of imaging modalities. They can all follow that DICOM standard and they all will be readable on the packs. So a DICOM image ends with the suffix M. So that just stands for a DICOM image. Just like if you're used to a JPEG or a TIFF or a GIF. And the DICOM and the top of the DICOM image is actually what's called a header. That header has some what we call meta information or information about the scanner that the image was taken on, about when it was taken, which hospital it was taken, and some information about the patients themselves. These are all in the header. So there's a block at the top that's actually the header, and it's separated into these separate things that are called tags. And the tags that are used in the different modalities are actually different. The tags are defined here, and these are defined in hexadecimal numbers. So if you actually open it up and the numbers look kind of funny because they have letters in them too, that's what's called hexadecimal numbers. The tags then have something called a value relationship and then the actual data from a given field. So then after that header information, which tells us about the type of scanner it was taken on and all of those goodies, about the parameters. So if it's a CT scan, it'll tell you the KVP, the MA, the rotation time, the helical pitch, all of those parameters that you specified on your user interface, those will all be in this metadata. And then behind that, we have what's called the image data. The metadata will describe the precision of the data that's gonna be in the image data, but then the image data itself is just a two-dimensional matrix. So it's just a 2D array with a number of pixels and each pixel just has one number in it. This is assuming we had a CT scanner and it was able to make a perfect image without any noise. And in that image, we just had air as the background to imagine. And then we had just a little square of water that's in the middle. That's what the image would look like here. Here I'm only showing six by six pixels, you typically have 12 by 5, 12 pixels, for instance, in the case of a CT image, and many more in the case of a lot of the x-ray images. If it's a CT or an MR pet, you're actually going to have many slices throughout the body. And depending on the modality, they're going to be saved with a different precision. If they're saved with more bits, then that actually means we can have a higher, what we call dynamic range in our images. If for each pixel, we store that pixel with more bits of data, we can then represent more grayscale levels. In general, the number of grayscale levels we have is two to the N, where N is the number of bits. The user can adjust the contrast in the image. They can do that with lookup tables. See our video on LUTs. They also can do that with window width and window leveling changing the window width and window levels, both of those things can be done on the display side. There's then a separate lookup, which actually maps to what's called the grayscale standard display function. We can also more generally call the luminance response function. 
We also have a video about quality assurance for our displays. We talk in that video about the luminance, how to calibrate it. And the fact is we actually have a curve like this that is the effect of brightness of each pixel, the visible photons that are coming out, this grayscale function, which is defined as part of the DICOM standard. This mapping is done such that a change in the input will look linear to our eye. The different parts of the curve have to actually make a bigger step in the luminance in order for it to look the same as a step for our eye. We've got more information about this in our display. These are just representative values of the given modalities and the size of the actual images that are being saved actually changes over time. And it's pretty much always going up. We're always saving more information. In CT, we're making finer slices and those slices were sampling with higher matrices over time. A CR system or computed radiography system typically gonna have about 2000 by 2500 pixels. Each is stored with between 10 and 12 bits. And then a typical exam has about 29 megabytes of storage when you count up all the different images that are taken. Then for your DR or DX system, a typical digital X-ray system, matrix might be slightly larger, about 3000 by 3000, 12 to 16 bits per pixel. That's, that's gonna give you about 40 megabytes. Mammal goes up a little bit more at about 3000 by 4000, because resolution matters the most there, about 12 to 16 bits per pixel. So you're at about 65 megabytes per a given average study. Then there's a big jump on breast tomosynthesis because in this scenario, both the, the raw projections and the tomographic images are being saved. Because there's multiple views and we're doing this tomosynthesis, check out our video on tomosynthesis if you wanna know more about how that works, leads to a relatively large size of about 400 megabytes. Then on the smaller end again is the fluoro, either the digital fluoro or the interventional fluoro. Both are typically around the third megabytes. Then CT, the standard has been for years of using a 512 matrix, but it's starting to go up now up to 1024, matrices being more common. And then, then on average, over 200 megabytes per study. The thing, MR has typically had smaller matrices than CT, but is also increasing the matrix size. A typical set would be about 50 megabytes. Ultrasound, about 138 megabytes. Nuclear medicine, about 16 megabytes. PET, because there's often more slices, they have a high number of bits per pixel. It's somewhere around 400 megabytes per study. These numbers are from Bushberg. So this is a study they did of the average size of their different exams from their relatively large hospital practice in Northern California. Then there's some things that aren't actually defined on a per patient or per exam study, is actually defined on a per reader study. These are called hanging protocols. So it harkens back to the day in which you would hang up the films and there was actually a protocol for how to hang up the x-ray films. You'd have a prior lateral film, then you'd have a P film. And nowadays it's actually defined on the monitor real estate. So essentially you define ahead of time where you want the different images to go for a certain type of read. This is a hanging protocol for a more complicated read, which is a breast R acquisition. So in this case, multiple different acquisitions are actually taken and then shown in the same repeated way so that the radiologist gets used to it. They can come in, just sit down and start scrolling through and they know where everything is. So there's a T2 image, there's a diffusion image, there's MIPS, there's difference images, and then there's a actual plot of some of the contrast in this MR changing over time. All these things can have different diagnostic values and having it there just always in the same position for the radiologist is super helpful from an efficiency standpoint. Note, these images can be 3D images. The DICOMs are actually saved and transferred as just 2D images, and they all get related to one another by that metadata. Even though each actual DICOM file is just one 2D image, they can actually be loaded in together in a 3D volume. It's very common for browsers nowadays to actually interact well with the 3D images that originally started as 2D DICOM images, but putting them in based on the metadata that tells you basically how thick each of the slices should be 
and where they're positioned with respect to one another. Now, you know all the fun about DICOMs, and DICOMs were born in the mid-80s, so around 1986. I was born before the early 80s, so late 70s, so actually, I'm older than DICOMs. Now, I know the basics of the DICOM standard, but see our video about the monitor quality assurance to actually know how these get shown in reality on your diagnostic monitors coming up.